Hello everybody, Computerized MTG here with the Black Y Control Deck Tech. So if you've seen my vlog, you'll know that this was a deck that I simply put together with cards that I had laying around uh, right before uh, going to my last FNM. And this was put together as a possible option to my blue-red control. Uh, obviously I ended up picking blue-red control over this. Uh, I, I don't know, there's just something about it. It seems like it's a fine enough deck, but there's just something about it that doesn't convince me. So I ended up with Blue Red Control. It's kind of more my style of gameplay anyway. So I figured, hey, I made the deck. Might as well show it, right? So this is not... I'm, I'm not going to pass this off as a end-all, be-all, black-white deck list. Like, you know, play this. Or, you know, if you're playing anything else, you're wrong, obviously. Everybody has their own style of play. This is just a deck that I put together and I figured, hey, you know what? It's not a bed shell, so I'll put it out there. Maybe it'll help somebody build on top of it, especially with Hour of Devastation. The field is wide open. Black White Control seems like a decent playable deck. Maybe this will help somebody as a starting shell and they can improve upon with the new cards. So let's get started uh, with the land base here. We have two copies of Concealed Courtyard. Once again, this was put together with the cards I had. There should be a four of, but I only had two Concealed Courtyards available. So only put two of them. Just a double land, you know, not, nothing really special, nothing much to say about that. Then I have four copies of Shambling Vent, and this card is absolutely amazing. Uh, if you're running Black White or Black White X, then uh, yeah, you're running Shambling Vent. This card is ridiculous. Uh, the, this deck, you'll, you'll notice the theme is gaining life. Uh, we want to be able to stay in the game, and the way that Black White Control does that, more often than not, is through uh, gaining life. So Shambling Vent fits that theme. It's a decent blocker early on. Can get in some damage once we uh, clear the board. So yeah, pretty good. Then I have one copy of Blight of Fen. Uh, not ideal early on, but you know, later on just taps for a colorless. It's fine. And it, if you ever end up in top deck mode, it, it gives you something to do with your mana. Still allows you to have removal open. Excuse me. Still allows you to have removal open. So, it's pretty good. I um, feel like one copy is fine in this type of deck. I always like running things like that, lands that can do something. Uh, so, you're not like only relying on your spells. Obviously, again, the example is top deck mode. This can obviously pick off things like Ulamog or whatever that in case we don't draw into Hunger Storm Making or cast out, then we can still deal with it. Now, I'm also running two copies of Evolving Wilds and Evolving Wilds and Blighted Fen both can also trigger revolt on fatal push for wh whatever that's worth and uh yeah so evolving wilds also obviously is here primarily to help us mana fix early on and uh later on kind of just acts as a filter if you will but yeah two copies is fine i would not really run more than two we're a dual land we're heavy on black we have plenty of black mana uh we can live without white for a few turns so i don't i don't really want to run more than two uh, evolving wilds then i am running i believe nine copies of uh, just basic swamp yep nine and then i am running seven planes Let's see yep seven planes that makes for a total of 25 lands i feel like 25 both for mid-range and control is kind of fine a lot of people right now want to run 26 27 lands um i feel like that's excessive 26 is fine 27 is pushing it, but 25 for me has been working fine so far. So anyways, let's move on to the removal, which is kind of what makes a control deck. And I'm running three copies of Fatal Push. Uh, that's a sweet spot for me. I don't like running more than three. I don't like running a full playset. Uh, that's just me. It hits a lot of stuff, but there's also a lot of stuff that it doesn't hit. It is an amazing removal. There's a reason why this uncommon is priced, the, what, the price point it's at right now. Um, so it's a good card. There's nothing much to say. If you've been playing standard or modern, for that matter, you know how good Fatal Push is. Then, the next best removal in standard, Grasp of Darkness. Almost as efficient as Fatal Push. Hits just as many target, maybe if not more. Uh, just great removal. Minus 4, minus 4 can get around things like uh, Indestructible. You can also, if you have 2 and you really need to get rid of a Gideon and you have no other answer, then you can pop 2 Grasps and it'll get rid of a Gideon. It's really good. Um, or, you know, if, if you have three of them and there's an Ulamog in play, then you can cash three of them and kill Ulamog. 
Uh, but yeah, it also kills things like Avacyn and whatnot. But yeah, Grasp of Darkness is really good removal. Immolating Glare here, um, I don't particularly like it too much, but it is efficient removal and it can help us keep a, a hand that, would, that might otherwise seem sketchy. And if you have a couple of white manas and then you have a grasp, you're probably going to be like, oh, you know what, that's a bad land. Or if you have one black, one white, you're going to be like, man, the only removal I have is grasp. Uh, no. But if you have Immolating Glare, one black and one white, then you can keep. Maybe you'll draw into a Fiddle Push or maybe you'll draw into another black. Anyways, it makes it easier on us to cast removal, gives us different options, and it's efficient removal as well, only two mana. Uh, fortunately, since we're not running red, we're, we obviously don't have access to other cheaper one mana removals like uh, Magma Spray or Shock, so Immolating Glare works fine for me in the deck. Then we have two copies of Anguish in the Making. Uh, this is another card where some people like to run more or less. For me, two is the sweet spot. I feel like with the life gain we have in this deck, losing up to possibly six life is fine. We can pad that. If we were running three or four, I feel like losing nine or even 12 light is just pushing it. So for me, Anguish in the Making is fine. It's a catch a lancer, hits anything except lands. So yeah. And the other reason why I don't want to run too many is because I'm also running three casts out, which in essence pretty much acts as an anguish that making costs one mana more, yeah, but you also don't lose the three life. And as we all know by now, cast out is just an amazing card because of cycle. It makes it a flexible card. No targets, you, you're early on, you need to hit your land drop, cycle this out, use that as a cantrip instead drawn to your land now you can cast your other stuff etc etc helps you stabilize your mana base so yeah cast out gives you flexibility and any card that's good and gives you flexibility is something that control likes then i'm running two copies of fumigate just your typical catch-all sweeper uh, we have other sweeper options in the sideboard but for the main board two fumigates works gets us some life if there's a several creatures the fumigate can actually get you a ton of life if your opponent is not expecting them to kind of go wide and flood the board and you fumigate this will definitely be a good stabilizing card but yeah fumigate just catch all board wipe so it's the board wipe of the format as of right now anyways this is obviously recorded before our devastation so yeah this is your basic five mana board wipe and then to finish off the removal, I have one copy of Forsake the Wardly. This is more so than anything a filler card. I needed one more card to hit 60, and this is kind of like the first thing I came across. I figured, why not? It's instant speed. It has cycle if I need to, and it can hit things like uh, fever visions. It can hit things like vehicles, which is very important. So I've been able to hit via a vehicle when my opponent plays and not have to wait for it to be crude or what have you. It's it can be relevant so figure why not it's a half decent card and it's a target that i can sideboard out so yeah one copy of forsake the wordly and that's it for the removal now moving on to the creatures uh this i I'm, i was originally running more planeswalkers and black and white was um the planeswalkers and black and white was kind of the reason why i made this deck to begin with as a possible options kind of like as a super friends control deck but I decided to put in a bit more creatures than I originally planned to. So it gives me more flexibility. I can play as a control deck or if I'm drawn into creatures as opposed to my walkers and more removal, I can play kind of as a uh, mid-range style deck. So starting off the creatures, we have Gaunti. Gaunti is just amazing. It's never a dead draw. Being able to take cards from your opponent library can literally turn the tide of the game. This guy is good. I almost wanted to put two copies. Uh, and then I was like, eh, maybe one in the main, one in the side. And then I just upped it out for one in the main. So, great card. Then, moving on, I have two copies of Kalidas, Trader of Git. This card is just great. <laughs> I mean, if you're running black, you're more than likely running Kalidas, whether it's in the sideboard, if not in the main, depending on what style of deck you're playing. But yeah, the fact that Kalidas essentially tacks on our, every single one of our removal hey exile target creature and get a 2-2 two -two zombie token is just great it's also got a decent body can block a few things and it's got lifelink so it helps us stay alive and the uh, sack ability can help trigger both um 
revolt on fatal push and it can help us flip avacing if we need to um, but yeah kalidas is a great great card primarily here to exile stuff and keep us alive then i have the bruna and Gisela combo uh bruna here more than anything is like the important piece obviously a combo is you put a Gisela first get in some damage block some creatures if you have to it dies whether it's in combat or uh, to removal and then you play bruna you bring back Gisela and you get um brisella which looks like this um you can go ahead and pause the video read what the card does i'm not going to take out the cards individually and flip them to show it looks pretty cool on the field but uh yeah that's brisella and just like that she's gone uh but yeah Gisela is good again it has lifelink first strike great blocker has evasion helps us stay alive kill stuff makes uh, attacking into uh, a Gisela difficult because of the first strike and Bruna is just huge, a 5-7 flyer with Vigilance, great attacker, great blocker. And can bring back more than just uh, Giselle and get uh, triggers off of things like Invala too. Uh, so that's good. Then we have two Noxious Gearhawks. I kind of wanted to include three of these, but then I opted out for just two. Uh, again, the theme of staying alive, we blow up a creature, we gain life equal to its, uh, what is it, power? Toughness. Equal to its toughness, so it blows up a threat gains us life and then it can be difficult to block if your opponent doesn't have too many creatures out and eh, five four is a decent body dies to things like grasp and whatnot yeah but you know a lot of creatures die to a lot of pieces of removal so um, that's not a reason to not run certain cards but yeah noxious gear hulk great card i feel like when compared to uh honestly every other gear hulk when compared to like torrential or uh what is it primordial what's the green one Vergerous, they're primarily gear hulks. Yeah, Vergerous and Torrential, the other two uh, gear hulks kind of come across as lacking. I should say the other three gear hulks. Yeah, I forget about the one. Yeah, you see, they come across as lacking, but yeah, Noxious Gear Hulk is great piece of removal and threat all in one card. Then we have two copies of Avacyn. Obviously, as a control deck, we're gonna all of our removal is pretty much at instant speed. We're gonna be keeping mana open a lot of the turns. So Avacyn, more often than not, we're just going to be casting at the end of the turn if we have her in hand and our opponent has nothing. This can also act as another piece of removal. Our opponent attacks, doesn't expect an Avacyn from the deck. We flash her in, block, kill something. Or if they swing in with a big creature, we flash an Avacyn, she gains indestructible, we block. No damage comes through unless, of course, there's trample involved. But yeah, Avacyn is just a great card. And again, we have ways... Of flipping her and yeah she can come down and protect creatures that we already have in play but more often than not she's just a, an evasive beater that we can flash in at the end of our opponent's turn or as a combat trick of sorts but yeah avacyn is great maybe it should only be running one copy really in this deck but i don't know she's an angel i can get her back uh, with uh, bruna and other things like liliana but yeah just a great card vigilance flying 4-4 body pretty good and then to finish off the creatures, I have one copy of Linvala, the Preserver. More often than not, we're going to get the the token. I don't know about the lab, but we're almost always going to get the token. But yeah, being able to double up on triggers with her is great. You know, you play her, you might get the life, you'll get the token. The next turn, you can play Brisella, uh, not Brisella, Bruna, if she gets removed. Play Bruna, bring Linvala back, get more life, possibly, and get more tokens. So... Pretty good card. I mean, Limvala is a great stabilizing card. If you're behind and you play Limvala and your opponent has no answers to it, you're in. <laughs> like he, you now have an out, and that's Limvala. Having her and a 3-3 body as well as possibly an instant life, great card. Uh, great control card. I love it. I played her in my Esper deck, and it, it did the job. It's a great card. So I suggest everybody to run this card. She gets undervalued a lot. Now, moving on to the Planeswalkers, kind of the reason why I made the deck. We have two Liliana, the Last Hope. Card is great, super efficient for a three mana Planeswalker. Her plus one can actually kill a few of the creatures that are played in standard right now. Uh, otherwise, it just kind of slows uh, decks down and helps us stay alive. Something that we want to do. We want to hit that late game. Minus two helps us bring back uh, creatures. Uh, primarily, we want to target things like Gear Hulk, Linvala, or Bruna, things that have ETB effects. Uh, and her minus seven just wins you the game. Unless it, it gets countered by like disallow or things like that. 
uh, yeah, when you minus seven, you will most all most likely always win the game. It's really hard to get around all those tokens. Next up, we have what is arguably the best planeswalker in standard right now, Gideon, ally of Zendikar. Uh, this is just an insanely powerful card. It's balanced. There's a lot of answers to it right now, and especially with our devastation coming out. Uh, yeah, hint, hint, name of the set. Uh, but yeah, the, the card is great. More often than not, you're just going to play Gideon, make that token to protect Gideon, and then just plus one from there on out and just beat face with them. So yeah, great card. <laughs> I mean, you'll, you're almost never going to minus four in this deck. There might be some scenarios when you have a few tokens out and, you know, pumping up those tokens is going to close in the game faster. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, just holding out Gideon as a beater is what you're going to be doing. Maybe you need to flood the board a couple turns, but otherwise, you're just going to plus one this guy after uh, after using his zero and just try to win with him. And he will win you games. He's if, if your opponent doesn't have an answer to Gideon, he just runs away with the game. Then we have one copy of Obnixilus. This is another card that I feel gets undervalued a lot. Uh, five mana for a murder. Yeah, not the best value there, but it says plus one. Just there were the Phyrexian Arena effect. Just every turn drawing two cards and a control deck is absurd. And as you've noticed, we don't have too much con uh, draw other than Obnixilis and the next Planeswalker, which I'm pretty sure you guys have guessed who it is. Actually, you've seen him in the little intro I made. So yeah, um, Obnixilis is great. Uh, his minus eight can win the game if your opponent can't finish you off fast enough it is literally a ticking clock for your opponent but uh he's primarily here for for his plus one we might minus three once or twice if we don't have removal uh but otherwise he's here for that plus one that constant draw and then finally uh what you can call i guess the face of the deck we have so two copies of soaring grim nemesis again this is one of those cards that if it hits the floor doesn't get answered right away it just runs away with the game yeah using this plus one and hitting lands kind of fucking sucks but uh yeah if you're hitting things like another soren linvala bruna you're talking about seven damage and getting card advantage that's ridiculous so it's easy in this deck to plus one reveal a gear hole you know all those expensive cards deal five damage deal seven damage deal six damage so on and so forth so yeah great card uh, his minus X is important too. Uh, it gains you life again, helps you stay in the game, uh, blows up creatures, but it blows up planeswalkers too. And I feel like that's more important than just simply killing creatures. His minus nine, I don't think I've actually ever used Soren's minus nine. His plus one has always just won me the game, really. So, anyways, Soren is an incredibly powerful planeswalker. Um, yeah. So that's it for the main deck. A lot of these cards I've seen play, they have, you know, if they're good, you know they're good. If they're bad, you know they're bad. These are not new cards, um, but yeah, just a quick rundown of the main deck. And yeah, let's skip on to the um, sideboard. All right, so here we are with the sideboard for the black-white control deck. Uh, starting off, we have two copies of Combo, Console of Allocation. Uh, this guy is great against anything that has a ton of non-creature spells, so Control, Burn, those type of decks. Forces them to waste removal on him rather than your other creatures. Whoops. Speaking of removing him. Uh, but yeah, if they if this guy doesn't get answering, they're just kind of blasting on spells, draw spells, etc., etc., answering other threats. This guy will create a huge life gap and can even... Uh, if you cast them late game and your opponent's low in life, it might just finish off your opponent. Your opponent like will have to really carefully think about what to cast and what not to cast. Or you might even be able to put them in a situation where they simply just can't cast anything. Then we have three copies of Transgress the Mind. This is here for grindier matchups where you want to rip resources from your opponent's hand. Uh, this is here for uh, non-permanent threats that we otherwise can't answer so yeah removing resources from your opponents so taking things like glimmer genius from a control player is just feels so good uh, but yeah so or even things that we don't want our opponent to cast like ulamog but yeah so transgress the mind is here for grind your matchups you know i guess mid-range control matchups so on and so forth fumigate is here it's just 
another board wipe just if we go up against a, a deck that just floods the fields you know like a super friends token style deck you know just floods the board and we just want to you know we need that life gain or against a bunch of uh, mid-range deck etc i just felt like i needed another fumigate and i also needed more cards to kind of fill in and i feel like having a third board wipe in your sideboard is not bad so i like fumigate i like having multiple board wipes in my control decks so I threw one in the sideboard to con, uh, plit, complete the Fumigate Trifecta. And uh, I can bring three in the main board if I need to. Next up, we have two copies of Lost Legacy. Again, this is for um, primarily non-permanent threats or cards that we don't want our opponent to just simply cast at all. Um, I see a lot of people are too afraid to like actually hit cards that you m normally wouldn't expect somebody to name. Like, if you're against control, or I should say another control deck, uh, primarily blue, blue X or, you know, b blue red or whatever, you know, any control deck running blue, don't be afraid to cast Lost Legacy and name Glimmer of Genius. It is such an ab absurd blow. You're taking away so much advantage from it, and it, and it takes away so much value from their Gear Hulk. It's uh, pretty great. Also, read the card. If you're new to the game, Read the card. Read it carefully. It says name a non-artifact. A lot of people seem to forget that. You have no idea how many times during the, while I play my blue red or even when I played my Esper deck uh, a while back, uh, a lot of people will go Lost Legacy, Torrential Gear Hulk. And unfortunately, that does not work. We have Dispossessed for that now, but yeah, don't make that mistake. I've seen people do it. It feels bad. So... Remember, you can't do that with Lost Legacy. Anguish I'm making, one copy of in the sideboard. This is just another catch-all answer. If for whatever reason, any other tool in the sideboard or any tools we have in the main board just can't deal with certain threats and we just need to exile some stuff, Anguish I'm making gets the job done. Then I have two copies of Thalia. She's just amazing. She's just a great card. Again, I feel like she gets undervalued sometimes. Uh, maybe right now she's just too vulnerable to removal and maybe it's a bad choice to have her in the sideboard but I feel like when you're going up against low to the ground decks having something like Thalia 3-2 with first strike your opponent unless they have pump spells or anthem effects they just can't attack into Thalia I've had at times when uh, when I used to play my Esper deck and I used to have Thalia and I bordered her in, my opponent would literally just go three, four turns without attacking until they drew removal or a pump spell to be able to get around Thalia. And at the same time, she also slows them down because guess what? Their creatures come into play tap. And if you're happening to play against a deck that has a ton of non-basic lands, well, that slows them down too. So Thalia is just a great tool. Great card, like her. Also, really like that uh, Promore. I don't know why it's worth less than the original one. I guess a lot of people prefer the original one, maybe. I don't know. I prefer the Promore. Then, more removal, because we're a control deck. What else would we be if we didn't have more removal? And one more copy of Fiddle Push. Um, this is just another uh, card to bring in against uh, low to the ground decks. Uh, you know, weenie decks, that type of stuff. You know... Fumigate too expensive, you pull out Fumigate, but in Fiddle Push, maybe we're against humans. We don't need the, you know, but what's it called? That enchantment uh, artifact removal I have in there. Maybe we don't need that to so bring in Fiddle Push. Although that enchantment artifact removal can hit uh, things like, uh, what's it called? Always Watching, which can make a difference whether or not you get to live an extra turn. So yeah, anyways, Fiddle Push, there for low to ground decks. And speaking of low to the ground decks, we have three copies of Flame Tendrils to finish it off. Again, this is something that I feel like is the sweet spot. You want to draw this early. Obviously, we have a similar card for similar mana cost uh, coming out in Hour of Devastation. I believe it is uh, Bontu's Last Reckoning or something like that. Uh, a lot of people, that it's kind of like a love-hate card. But yeah, anyways, three copies of Flame Tendrils. The fact that it exiles is great. Obviously, we're not in red, so we can't run things like Radiant Flames because we're not three colors, if what it makes sense. Uh, and we obviously, without the red, we can't run things like Sweltering Sun. So we're going to miss creatures that have three toughness or higher, but hitting things with two toughness 
still gives us a lot of things we can kill with this. This will almost always wipe the board against weenie decks, against uh, you know your typical red deck win type of deck. It, it will wipe the field almost always. And exiling stuff is important against things like uh, Scrap Heap Scrounger and uh, Dreadful Warrior, is it? I can't remember. The two one zombie that can be brought back. So yeah, exiling stuff important and minus two, minus two can kill enough stuff. So anyways, that's the main board. That's the sideboard for my black white control deck that I threw together on a whim. Let me know what you think. Um, Unlike the blue red control deck, I'm not going to do an updated version for Hour of Devastation. If you guys want to see my thought of what I might be able to include from Hour of Devastation, let me know. If I decide to play the deck, I will actually do another deck tech showing the deck with the improved cards. Otherwise, that's it. So once again, let me know what you think about the deck. If you're running black white control, let me know. Did this help you? Did this not help you? share uh what your deck differs from mine and uh once again if you want to see my thoughts on cards that i could include from our devastation uh let me know and i might just make a video about it otherwise follow me on twitter where i like share other stuff from other content creators and don't remember to like share and comment on my videos subscribe to my channel and as always have a wonderful day and i'll see you all in the next video